Father, we thank you for the gift of children. God, we pray you bless them. God, we, we pray you would reveal yourself to them in a profound way as they, as they seek you in their time of instruction together, Lord. God, we pray for wisdom in how to, to, to steward the gift that you've given us and all these children. Pray you'd help us to, to be healed ourselves so that we might not pass on generational curses to our children, Lord. God, help us to love you, to follow you, so that they might love you and follow you. We invite you today to speak to us through your word, Lord. God, apart from you, we can do nothing. So we pray, God, that you would meet us here by the power of your spirit, transform our hearts. Guide us into your love, Lord. Reconcile us with you. That we might know you, that we might love you, and that we might be transformed by you, God. Speak to us this morning in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. It was somewhat enthusiastic, at least in, in corners of the room, but I'll, I'll allow it. This is a good place to be together this morning to worship our God. Uh, this morning, specifically, we're going to begin our journey through the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, I cannot imagine, in the context of the whole of Scripture, a more relevant book to study in this season of life together. See, the context of the, of the city of Corinth and the, and the church in Corinth in the first century is probably as close as it gets from a biblical perspective to where we find ourselves in this moment in our culture today. See, Corinth was a Roman Empire city. It's located in Greece. It was a metropolitan melting pot of religions and cultures. But it was also, perhaps more importantly, a city of self-actualization. A city of wealth creation. A city that, with an emphasis on identity and one that valued highly uh, individualization and purpose in life. So simply put, this was a culture that placed the highest value on following one's own desires and passions, right? To follow one's heart would have been seen as supremely good advice in the city of Corinth. So I don't imagine it's difficult for you to begin to see the parallels between our culture and, and the culture in Corinth. If you know anything else about the church in Corinth, it's probably that, that it was super messed up. Right? It was a messed up place. They had all sorts of problems which rose from the fundamental desire within them to satisfy their deepest longings and desires and to satisfy them themselves. So we could expect that their spiritual father in St. Paul would come in with proverbial guns blazing, right? Telling them everything that they've done wrong and condemning them for it. This is probably what I would have done, right? Like, you guys are idiots. You need to get your act together and stop sinning so much. But Paul chooses a different route, and I'll get to why I think he chooses a different route in a few moments, but I just want to acknowledge a little bit of my own background and baggage that I have with a passage like this, with a topic like this, because I assume and imagine that at least a few of you are in a similar boat. See, I experienced Christian faith when I was growing up as being supremely judgmental and discouraging. I don't think I was uniquely perceptive or anything like that, but what I 
saw it causing people to do was to live double lives. On Sundays, everything was perfect. Right? All the families were together. They all had it put together. They wore their best outfits to church. And everyone, and I mean everyone, was 100% committed to their faith on Sunday. Though I knew our family was different because I went to church with my family and then I went home with my family, it took a while for me to realize and to begin to see the cracks in the facade of the other families in our church. And in a weird way, this shook my faith. Because I held out hope in those other families, in those other nice, normal-looking families, that perhaps God could bring the same thing in my family. Now, this hope was obviously misplaced, right? But nevertheless, it was no less real. No moment made me feel like this was more real than one particular time that I was hanging out at, at my pastor's house. So I was there one day and, and, and sitting in another room, but, but from across the house, I heard the pastor's wife stub her toe and say a cuss word. I know, it's a pretty big deal. You must understand, though, that, that this was something at this point in my life and, and that in our tradition that only bad people did, only bad people said cuss words. Yet in my mind, this was the, probably the second most godly person in our church using those words. And I was heartbroken. Again, I was shaken. Now, I find this somewhat hilarious now because I laugh every time I meet someone because within... Ten minutes of meeting them, they've probably used five cuss words, and when they find out I'm a pastor, you can see that look in their eyes where they're rewinding the conversation back, trying to figure out all the things that they should apologize for. It's a look of sheer terror, and I laugh every single time. But I think most of us have probably grappled with something like this within our walk with Jesus. Jesus inevitably, eventually, we realize that there are people out there who are hypocrites, right? I mean, within the evangelical Christian world, just within the evangelical Christian world, it's a relatively small world, we have seen story after story after story of prominent figures being shown to publicly not be able or willing to live up to their own standards and values, if you've been around for the faith for a while, you've probably had someone you specifically looked up to or respected that's had a massive moral or leadership failure. I know I have. It isn't just, though, the, the scandalous moments that are jarring. It's also the, the more insidious moves that I think are heartbreaking professor and, and social commentator Carl Truman pointed this out in an article that he wrote in First Things magazine. And I think he sums up well the, the sort of other side of leadership failure. He first says, the, the first um, sort of option that, that people take in terms of, of failing as leaders is to get an angry sense of entitlement an impulse to denounce the entire world and to withdraw into cultural isolation. To demonstrate this, he talks about religious fundamentalism and their withdrawal from public engagement. The defining characteristic about th this sort of option is that, that these folks are against things, right? They're against alcohol and evolution and secular music and dancing, and the list goes on and on and on. But he says there's an alternative tendency as well. He describes this as more subtle and, su and seductive. The second tendency is to, is to conform Christianity to the spirit of the age. This appeals particularly those to who he says wish to gain a seat at the table among society's social elite. So perhaps the clearest 
form of this distinction showing the two sides in recent memory came in the 2016 presidential election, right? And the response, particularly the response of Christians to that election. You were either pro-Trump and therefore relegated to the, the margins by the cultural elites or you were pressured to be completely against Trump. There was no room for reluctant support or anxious opposition. This is perhaps the most tangible example in our memory, but I believe this can be applied to basically any issue that is valued by culture at large. It's either this or that, and there's no room for the middle. See, remember, the culture in Corinth, though, was much the same as our own. And I think that we'll we'll see many of these same temptations existed for them to be on one side or the other, to either run from culture or run to it, to either be separated completely from the world or be accepted by it. And I think into that temptation, Paul writes this letter, this first letter to the church in Corinth. So if that's the case, then we should expect him to again come out shooting, right? From one perspective or the other. If we're inclined to one side or the other, then we're waiting for him to pounce on the other side. Yet if that's our expectation, if that's how we expect him to open the letter, what we get is utterly shocking. What we get is not condemnation, What we get is not judgment. What we get is not him saying that one side is right or wrong. What we first get is encouragement. Right? What we first get is an utter shift in perspective. See, I believe that this comes through in, in, in sort of three basic angles that, that in, at which, from which Paul is looking at the issues and at issues within the church. So the first the way that Paul encourages them, I believe, is through a shift in their identity. In verse 2, he points out that they're part of something bigger. They're part of the church of God as he describes it, the gathering of God's people in the city of Corinth. Not only are they part of something bigger, but they're sanctified in Christ Jesus and can be called saints. Now, I think this fundamentally pushes back against the polar perspectives that I gave earlier. They can neither retreat from culture nor fully embrace it because they are fundamentally operating within a different reality that exists in conjunction with the reality that that was experienced by those who do not know Christ. To put it another way, through Christ, they can see things with his perspective and therefore see things as they really are and not as they seem. They are no longer who they were, longing for something to fill a void within them. They have now had all of their longings ultimately satisfied in Christ. Not only are they fundamentally different, though, but through that shift in their identity, they are able to understand that they aren't the point in the first place. So not only is who they are shifted, but also whose they are. They are no longer belong to themselves and their own sense of reality and their own sense of identity, but they belong to God. We see this first in in verse 2, the second half of verse 2, but basically in all of 4 through 9, and I think we'll see this if I read through it again, adding emphasis on every time God is mentioned in this passage. Beginning in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ. 
But in every way you are enriched in Him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you are, were called into fellowship, into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Fundamentally, everything is about God. The whole story from start to finish, from the first page of the Bible to the very last page, is about God and His intervention in the world. It isn't about us. We are important to the grand narrative only in that we have been called into reconciliation through Jesus. See, it isn't only about the change in who we are and whose we are, but it is fundamentally about what God has done for us. We love to try to make it about ourselves and to make ourselves the center of the story. We love to read the Bible as if we are the main character. We love to insert ourselves into all the cool stories. I'm just like David. I'm going to slay all those giants. That's just not what it's about. From page one to the last page, the primary one who acts with sovereignty in the context of Scripture is God. Humans, us, we're just like sheep, right? We constantly go astray. We see it in the story of Israel, right? They, they make a, what should have been an 11-day journey, stretch out to 40 years. I think we see it in our own hearts as well. How many of you have been on an 11-day journey for 40 years? To, to ask the question another way, how many of you took a lot longer to learn something than it should have taken. <laughs> How many of you still haven't learned that lesson that you know God is trying to teach you? Now, I'm laughing because I only ever preach sermons that I need to hear. And so, so maybe I'm the only one here who needs to hear this, but I'm guessing I'm not alone. So I just want to personalize this, the, the takeaways from this passage just a little bit. Because maybe you, you need to be encouraged. sanctification that we have is not our own, but extended to us by God. To not be able to live up to the standard that you profess does not make you a hypocrite. It just makes you human. The only way to be a hypocrite is to think that you can somehow do it on your own. That it's somehow possible to do and to be good enough simply have to trust that your identity is different if you have placed your faith in Christ Jesus. Because because of this, you are different first and foremost because you belong to Him. Especially in those areas where there seem to be discrepancies between what you know you should do and how you feel. Trust that God is good and that He is for you. 
Be encouraged, even when the, even when you're faithless. The God who called you in the fellowship with His Son is faithful. I believe as we embrace these fundamental perspective shifts together, I think it has potential to change our experience of church. And perhaps more, more importantly, it has the ability to change the experience of church for those who are on the outside. Perhaps even more importantly, it has the ability to change the perspective of church for our children. See, our fundamental identity is not as religious people who've got it all together, but as a community of ragamuffins who are dependent on the grace and mercy of Jesus for everything. Who aren't shocked when people make the wrong choice. But, are, but never fail to celebrate what God has done anytime other, we and others make the right choice, knowing that it's a miracle anytime we get it right. See, this develops in us grateful hearts and a passion to worship. To worship the one who has saved us. As we develop in our hearts this gratitude, we are simply free to follow. Free to follow Jesus without the need to confront culture or to adapt to the values of culture. If we are in Christ, we are simply above culture. And not because we are somehow better than other people, but because we know the truth of ultimate reality. That we are fundamentally sinners in desperate need of a Savior. Our focus then becomes not on comparison with the external world, but on what God has declared to be true. The very God who created the world and all that is in it. As we continue in worship this morning, may our hearts be filled with gratitude. That if we are in Christ, our identity has been shifted from sinner separated from God to saint reconciled to God by the blood of Jesus. Let's embrace this identity and rest. In the reality that we belong to the God who doesn't sit idle, separated from his creation. The God who put on flesh and came to save us. I offer this to you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.